Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's such a pleasure to have you all here today for our presentation. I know our original session had a different title, but we have one presentation today, and it looks fantastic. It's called Evolving Approaches in BC's 2023 Point in Time Homeless Counts. But before I talk about that, I'd like to give a quick land acknowledgement. Uh, we are in Mi'kma'ki, the unceded ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people. They have taken care of and stewarded these lands since time immemorial. The presentation today uh, will be uh, given by the authors, uh, Stephen D'Souza and James Casper Kaspersen. I'm so sorry, Kaspersen. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, Kaspersen. Um, and they're gonna talk uh, specifically about BC and their point in time count. So I'm gonna leave these two to it and uh, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, welcome everyone. Super excited to be presenting to you today about our, our point in time count and really appreciate the uh, land acknowledgement at the beginning. De uh, reconciliation is a, is a big part of our work. Uh, so I'll introduce myself in, in a way taught to me by some of our local nations in BC. Good morning, my name is Stephen D'Souza. My pronouns are he, him, his. My father, uh, Joseph D'Souza, is from Goa uh, through Africa and immigrated to, to Montreal, Quebec. My mother is French Canadian. Her father, Roger Bruyere, was a vet in the Vietnam, or no, no, Korean War and World War II. And my grandmother, uh, Helen, was a, a war bride coming to Canada. So I'm both uh, a product of settler practices and colonialism in Africa and India, as well as from a settler family here in Canada. Uh, I'm really excited to be here with you today. Part of our work uh, in doing the homeless count was to really focus on how do we um, really connect with hidden homelessness, those who are traditionally undercounted within homeless counts. And we know always talk about homeless counts as, please come in, come on in. Thanks. No, not the climate change one, no problem. <laughs> so um, as we go through the presentation today, really encouraging you to ask questions at any time. Just raise your hand, ask a question. We have a couple of slides, but this is meant to be conversational. So don't wait to the end, don't write your question down. Raise your hand, we'll come around with a microphone and some cookies, ask your question, okay? Uh, and then we will also have some questions for you. Uh, I'm joined today with my colleague James Kasperson, and uh, James will introduce himself in a, in a few minutes. Um, so speaking about the, the point in time counts, uh, HSABC led 20 point in time counts in March, uh, from March to early May of this year, as well as led the point in time count for Greater Vancouver. And part of our presentation today, we'll talk about some of that data, but uh, primarily we'll be looking at some of the techniques and approaches that we used. Additionally, within uh, BC, there were four other federally funded counts, as well as two independently or self-funded counts in the community. And we're not gonna really be touching on them. We are in a process of aggregating all the data from all the counts across the province, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, if you're interested in the reports themselves, please feel free to uh, go to our website, and there's a, a link there you can use, and there's a QR code at the end if you're interested in seeing the full reports. Before we dig into the data and, and our approaches, wanted to take a moment to recognize that our work uh, was conducted on the uh, stolen and occupied territory of numerous indigenous communities, uh, including several nations, including the Kwatlin, the Squamish and Tsleil Tooth, where, where I live, and the Musqueam nations, where I live, as well as uh, Metis Nation and Treaty Territory. So we try to work closely with our Indigenous partners as well as First Nations communities throughout the count, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the work that we do uh, at HSABC. We try to uplift the voice of Indigenous people and are working towards Indigenous status sovereignty and are trying to be a partner and ally in uh, nationhood for all of our communities that we work with. Wanted to start with a, uh, a question. There's been a lot of... Surprisingly, a lot of conversations about data and point in time counts throughout the, the last couple of days. And I know this is like day three, the last session. So I wanted to see 
to start with to see if there's any challenges that you're facing in point in time counts that you haven't heard any discussions about yet. Things that maybe you're really interested in hearing more about or digging more into, and we'll try to focus on that even if we don't have a slide, we'll try to come back and reference that. And then what, your, what are your expectations for today's workshop? So I'm gonna put it out there as a question. We have a mic here. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks so much. I think for myself, I'm really interested in um, some of the challenges that we've experienced in terms of um, locating like harder to reach uh, populations of young people, particularly 2S LGBTQ uh, youth who may not access services, and so then they don't have the opportunity to complete the survey. Just ask questions at any time then. Don't feel like you have to get it all out now. Um, so we'll, we'll move on from there and I'll pass it to my colleague James who will talk, and I should reference, we, we, we will be talking a little bit about youth homelessness specifically and some of the work that we're doing both through our count and then partnering with some other qualitative research that's happened in our community. So we will come to that. Thank you, Alex. And I'll pass it over to James who will talk a little bit about some of the results from our counts. Sure, thanks, Stephen. Uh, can everybody hear me through this one? Uh, my name is James Casperson. Uh, I work with the Homeless and Services Association of BC uh, on the implementation side, so working with our coordinators uh, in each of these communities to, to support their counts. Um, and I think we have this slide up here, uh, not so that you can glean as much information out of it as possible, because it's a lot of data and we have uh, reports available on a link that we'll have at the end. Uh, but just take a look at this and see sort of a community that you might have seen uh, in terms of either the change over time uh, or a population similar to, to something around you. And just take, take a look and see if there's something familiar in that. Uh, the one thing that sticks out to me across the board is the, the increase since, since 2020 and, and 2021. Uh, you'll note the 2020 slash one is because half of them were done before the pandemic and half of them were done uh, when things became safe again. And that's a big reason why uh, some of our, our process changed, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, but it tells a story of, of increase no matter the size of a, a community, which, uh, which is a story that I think I've heard a little bit in this conference uh, around rural and remote, uh, also around the medium-sized communities, uh, so like your Vernons and things like that on there. Um, this also, just to sort of note what, why these 20 are here, uh, these are the 20 that are included in our provincial count, so this ex excludes any reaching home communities. Um, so that's the one that uh, they're going to be releasing their own data later. And then here's, uh, we also conducted the count in Metro Va or Greater Vancouver, um, so 11 sub-regions. We kind of group some municipalities to, together. Uh, basically in the way that they organize themselves in terms of homelessness services. Uh, and the, the story is, is similar here. Uh, increase, uh, actually in, in Greater Vancouver, uh, we had the largest increase uh, year over, or count over count, so every three years in the same cycle that, uh, that Reaching Home does, uh, that has happened since Vancouver has been doing counts, uh, since 2005. Um, so that's one of the things that I appreciate about this methodology is it's a way to tell stories using this sort of the same thing being done-ish um, since 2005. Uh, and that's, I think, to me, one of the values. And that's one of the things that I reflect on when I learn about uh, other ways to enumerate uh, by names, lists, service delivery records, things like that. Um, that's one of the, the sort of nuggets that I think uh, maintains import, uh, its importance that we'll, we'll kind of touch back and, and come back on a few times throughout this. Um, spoke a little bit at the beginning around our commitment to decolonization. That was very much embedded in the work that we did through the count. Working closely, uh, we had an Indigenous consultant on our, our count team 
uh, Rocky, who we'll, we'll talk about a little bit as well, uh, but also had Indigenous-led organizations leading the counts in many communities across the province, uh, worked with specifically with First Nations communities, and did counts on, in some cases on their land with their, with their teams as well. And then uh, through our work have made uh, our data available to many of the First Nations community as well as the Métis Nation around to ensure Indigenous status sovereignty. Not only are we providing them with the data, we're also offering to assist with the analysis and coming up with any community profiles or anything that they want to do with that data. So that commitment to Indigenous data sovereignty. And from that you can really see the impacts of, of colonization and ongoing genocide and the over-representation of Indigenous people within Metro Vancouver. In, in this case, so you're looking at um, you know 33% of the homeless identified in Metro Vancouver identified as Indigenous, self-identified as Indigenous versus 2.4% of the population, and that's 13 times more than than the overall population. Uh, this year, we also introduced a, a new question in partnership with our Indigenous-led organizations, uh, asking, uh, looking into intergenerational impacts of residential school. So asking if they, their parent or grandparent, attended residential school, and uh, in collaboration or looking at that data, including the foster care data, you can see that there's, uh, in Metro Vancouver, 64% of the Indigenous population identified as having attended or having a parent or grandparent attended a residential school. 6% identified that they, had, they themselves had attended a residential school, which I think just reinforces how recent this is. It, it's, not a, it's not in Canada's past. It's, it's an ongoing impact for individuals, both personally and through their families. And then 51% have had direct impact with the foster care system. Uh, and so that's the Metro Vancouver data. And then in Prince Rupert. Yeah, so in our, our 20 BC communities, so outside of, uh, of Metro Vancouver, uh, this is the one that kind of stuck out the most to, to me. Uh, so 88% of respondents there identified as, uh, as Indigenous, uh, the vast majority of them having lived or generational experience with, uh, with residential school. Uh, and that was a story of that uh, that region's geography, that's natural history. It's one of the biggest ports in, in Western Canada, the economic development that came with it. Um, and it really highlighted uh, some very specific service delivery needs uh, for that community. And really looking at this question though, of residential schools, we wanted to do it in a good way. So we partnered with the Indian Residential School Survivor Society, both in developing the question, and they indicated that we shouldn't just jump into the question when we're doing the surveys on the street, that we, we need to, to ask permission and ask to consent to ask that question. So right on the survey and in our training, there was the question right at the beginning, do you provide our next question is about Indian residential schools. Are you comfortable with us asking that question? If someone said no, we moved on, no questions asked. So there are a number of people who probably could have answered that question but didn't because we, it was important to us to have consent to ask that question specifically. We also, in, in our reporting out of that data, wanted to make sure that we provided the appropriate context. So work with some of our Indigenous partners to identify specific texts provided by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission as well as the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation to provide context right into our report. And every time we would kind of present the data, try to talk about this as framing it within the, the, the legacy of colonialism and the ongoing genocide that's impacting our communities and how, that, how residential schools continue to play an ongoing role within the trauma and the intergenerational trauma experienced by these communities. So it was important for us to provide that context and framework with sharing this data so someone can't just look at that and not understand why it's important for us asking that question. And then I mentioned Rocky, who was part of our research team. We had a chance to sit down with him as well as some of our partners, but it was Rocky who, looking at the data, provided some reflection that I'm gonna allow Rocky's voice to be here. I'm, I'm gonna read it, but I, I'm gonna say his words as he said them. Uh, I almost don't even know how to respond, except the legacy of Indian residential school system continues to have a profound impact on indigenous health disparities. It really does need to be addressed through an upstream approach. It moves the narrative on disparities from abstract to ongoing living experiences of systemic impression, injustice, and a failure to recognize with Indigenous people on equitable access to housing. If we are to see housing as a human right, then this data represents an ongoing violation of Indigenous human rights to access safe, affordable, and culturally appropriate housing. Thank you, Rocky, for that quote. 
before I move on from this section around some of our work uh, around decolonization within the count and some of the work that we did, I wanted to take a, a moment just to beat to see if there's any questions around that. I might just jump in, Stephen. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that we heard um, kind of too late in engagement, to be completely honest, so this is kind of a, a lesson learned if folks are looking to, to do this in the future. Um, depending on geography, so where in the province the community was, uh, there's either more folks with history, uh, generational or, or lived with residential school, or day school. And that was a missed opportunity for us because we came across it too late. Um, and they're t very different experiences, but I would encourage sort of asking those questions if you're looking to do work in, in community. And one of the lessons that we learned from one of our communities who did ask that question is they embedded it within the residential school question. And so it became sometimes difficult to ask or understand uh, what the response was. So ask them separately. So do you have an intergenerational experience of residential school? Do you have an intergenerational experience of, of day school? Um, so you can sort of look at that data set separately and understand the impacts kind of separately. Uh, with all of this data, we continue to be working with Indigenous partners to look at some of the cross-sectionality of, of the data and try to do some of that analysis. It's ongoing work, and we want to make sure that they're leading that work. Um, so working with a number of, of organizations as well as committees and councils throughout our community, including the Indian and Home, Indigenous Homelessness Steering Committee for Metro Vancouver around that data set and saying, okay, what else do you want to know? Like, how can we look at some of the health data that's in the count along with this data to better understand the impacts? And that's ongoing work and hope to, to share in the near future. Uh, the next session, we'll be talking a little bit about the, the role of peers and, and persons with lived and living experience in, in the work over the last few years. But before I, I pass it over to James, just wanted to frame this that uh, we extensively use the Research 101 uh, Manifesto for Ethical Research in the Downtown East Side. That was developed in 2019. It's a fantastic resource if, you, if you're working with peers in, in research. I would encourage you to look it up. It's from the voice of the Downtown East Side talking about if you're coming into our community, it can't just be extractive. You need to have us as part of the whole process. And so we had peers involved in reviewing the survey questions, uh, really taking a lead in a lot of the approach that we did. Uh, they, they were involved in setting up all of the routes as well as helping us reflect on the analysis and they were crucial members of our survey teams and that's a little bit about what James is going to dig into but really want to make sure that if you're going to go into this work of bringing peers and persons with lived and living experience into your research you really do it in an authentic and a real way and bring them in throughout the process so it doesn't just feel like it's ex extractive. So anybody here that's uh, conducted a, a point in time count in the past, um, at least the, the experience in BC is there's a lot of tradition uh, embedded in it. There's people that have been doing it for a long time. And like I mentioned at the beginning, that's one of the values of it is to do the same thing over and over. Um, a lot of what, we're, what we've changed, what we've learned, uh, we owe a little bit of gratitude to having to do it during the pandemic. Uh, we were shown that we can sort of break down some of these rules. Um, and that's really where we took a lot of these learnings from. Um, the overall sort of idea uh, when we were doing the eight, you know, during the pandemic, so this is when uh, travel restrictions were just lifted, so we're not quite in the prime of it. People were learning. We uh, had COVID-19 protocols in place, masking, sanitizer, things like that. Um, we decided that in order to, we didn't want to get volunteers together. Uh, and that's usually a hallmark of, of point in time counts is these big training sessions, introducing people to people who would not otherwise be talking directly to each other. We thought that was an unnecessary risk. So what we're going to do is we're going to find people who are already talking to each other. And that's what inspired this, uh, this sort of leaning in to using uh, peer teams, asking people in community, you know, who do you know that doesn't have a place to pay rent? Uh, and providing honorary to organizations to have their outreach workers, case managers, uh, people in hospital, social workers. Uh, we basically put a, a large call out and said, if you work with or know somebody who doesn't have a place to pay rent, I want to know because I want to bring some surveys to you on this date. Um, and maybe I'll highlight the, that is the definition that we in, in BC still use for four point in time counts is anybody that doesn't have a place to pay rent. Uh, living in transition houses, uh, 
correctional facilities, hospitals, things like that, who are, don't have a place to leave when they, or to go when they leave. Uh, I know there's other definitions out there. There's other definitions that are useful in different contexts. Uh, but because of the tradition of point in time counts and the proximity of many of these communities to designated communities that do point in time counts, there is a lot of interest in being comparable uh, in the, the context that we're, we're working in. Um, so that was basically the ask. If you know somebody that doesn't have a place to pay rent, we want to hear from you. Um, and it was such a dramatic change that none of our coordinators, many who have been doing point in time counts for four or five, I think one of them had done six before we even came around, uh, none of them went back to using volunteers. And I want to acknowledge volunteering is important in this sector. Point in time count can be a good way to get people in touch with homelessness serving organizations for the first time, learn about homelessness, talk to people. Yes, there's some knock-on effects for that. Uh, but in terms of in some of these communities where you need to enumerate as many people in 24 hours as you can, um, it was much easier to focus on some of the other stuff that we'll talk about than coordinating volunteers. And that did free up some time for the coordinators themselves in those communities, right? Because they didn't have to do all that recruitment. I mean, they used some of the volunteers who might be already part of outreach programs and different pieces, uh, peers who were volunteering in their program. But bringing able to, to bring in people who knew the sector, knew the community really well, meant that you could focus the training like the day before. Uh, day before the count, get all together, go through the survey together, answer any questions. So it changed some of the, the coordinators' time and allowed them to shift that focus into how do you engage with sort of undercounted communities. So it freed up some capacity as well by making that change. Yeah, and, and one of the big sort of time savings was from uh, the shift in, in training. Uh, we realized that training no longer has to include how to talk to somebody experiencing homelessness like it does for volunteers. So already that knocks an hour off the training. And then we start working with outreach workers who have done this before and that knocks another half an hour off the training. And then we realize, okay, there's some people who would love to participate. They know folks who don't have a place to pay rent, but they're not able to, um, to make a training session. So we said, you know what, it, that's okay. Tell me where to meet you on the day of the count. I'll drop off the surveys. I'll show you how to do them. We're gonna take 10 minutes or less. These are the important pieces. And we found that was a really powerful tool to sort of make those staff feel much more empowered. Uh, what we ran into, and you know, I, a part of this, you know, being quite honestly the guy from Vancouver that comes to help us with our homeless counts, we try to minimize that effect as much as possible. Uh, it showed that you know, I know you know what you're talking about. I'm going to give you just a couple quick pointers, and then you are responsible for for taking it to to support your community from here. Uh, and that actually quite worked. It, it helped a lot for for me as an outsider, uh, and also for getting some folks, particularly the health authority, that otherwise would not have capacity to be able to get into um, to a training session. Um, the in terms of the the routes, uh, we really scaled down. So in particular, um, those of you that have planned a point in time count. Uh, using the toolkit, it's a big mapping session, get as many people as possible, and it's kind of a buckshot approach to getting as many folks out on the street uh, as possible. Uh, this, it's outreach workers, we're asking them, go find your people. If you want to tell us where you're going, great, but if your people don't want us to know you're there, we don't care, here's your surveys, here's your icebreakers, come on back later, uh, go have at it, you know your people better than we do. Uh, so we would start on the day of the count. We didn't ask these folks to take any time before their, their count shift. Um, we would just say, show up, you know, six, seven, eight in the morning, whatever was uh, made sense for the community. We're going to show you how to do the surveys in a half an hour, and then you are, are out there to, to do it uh, from there. Call us if you need anything, and then we spend the day kind of driving and walking around, checking in with folks. And then in conversation and working directly with peers, uh, in, in different communities, it was, it was different feedback. Like, don't use the word homeless in this community. It's a survey about housing. And because the, the people responded differently to the word homeless. Uh, you know, when you're going into in, or to engaging with people in RVs in Squamish, don't talk to them about being homeless. Use different language. It's about housing in, in the community. So there's a lot of feedback that came from peers that was really, really important. Or this, we're doing surveys with people who don't have a place to pay rent. And so this personalizing 
bringing in the peers and the persons with lived experience to inform this meant that each count had a slightly different personalized effect to it, and it also empowered some of those peers to be more dialogical in their conversations. So yes, they had to answer these questions, but they could go out and have a conversation, and as they're having the conversation, kind of answering the questions and then going back through and looking for what they're missing. So bringing in persons with lived experience really helped to shape the way that in each community that the count was done because it really reflected the local culture of, of the community that was there and the unhoused community that was there. Uh, we also try to encourage people to just start the survey, do the screening, and then just keep the conversation going, give them some more cookies. Anyone more cookie? Anyone want more? Anyone want more cookies? Cookies? Uh, just keep giving out cookies, keep the conversation going. Um, so just continue to engage. And then most of the time, the vast majority of surveys were fully completed. Even if someone said, oh, I only have a few minutes, well, why don't we just talk? And we'll, well, try to do the survey as long as a cigarette, if you can. You know, like try to keep it as short as possible. But the vast majority of surveys were fully completed because that, that data, even at the very end of the survey, is incredibly important. So that full engagement was, was great. And peers that really helped us come up with some of those techniques and approaches to keep that going. And before you flip, Stephen, um, I'll share that, you know, I, I think everybody has been approached by somebody uh, on the streets that said, hey, do you have time to take a survey? Do you want to sign a petition? Things like that. And I tell people this in the trainings, is you've all said no to that, I've said no to that, I used to do that for a living, and I say no to that. Um, so make it more conversational. Ask where you're looking to talk to people about housing and homelessness uh, in your community, and that gets people interested. Uh, then you sort of tear it, pare it down, go, okay, we've got a survey for folks that don't have a place to pay rent. Don't have time for a survey? I'm just gonna ask you three quick questions. That's the screening questions, you're done. And then after that, like Stephen said, the vast majority that are started are completed. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more through the presentation of the role in peers, particularly when we get into youth and some of the other populations, because there's very specific approaches that was brought, particularly because we got that feedback from the community, like this is important to us. Don't give us pizza, we get pizza all the time. Let's talk about something different. Rebecca. I have a question about so we need this, we need the microphone because the translation. Thanks. I have a question about shelters. Um, typically, the surveys tend not to be as well completed in shelters, and I was wondering if you did anything differently this year to change that. Yeah, so the, the biggest approach, and this was noticed most significantly in, in the greater Vancouver count, just because the scale is, is much larger. You can see if you make a little change, how, many, how much changes much quickly, or much qu quicker. Um, we took that same approach of using staff rather than volunteers and that made a massive difference. So staff, number one, they have the relationship with, uh, with clients, uh, and they also sort of have the reason, they understand they're working in the field, and this is a data collection activity, and we want to do these because they, they know that it's important, uh, particularly for staff that have done this a couple of times, and in some of our communities, you've seen investment after each one of these, which is a, a good sign, so there's that, that buy-in. Um, staff aren't universally the silver bullet to doing enumeration in shelters. Uh, we always ask the shelter operator, you know, based on your capacity, what do you want? Uh, if it's, you know, if you need another $100 to bring in a casual for uh, four hours to do surveys, great, we'll do that. But if there's something to do with your program or you'd rather have volunteers, there were a few programs that still selected that. Um, we'll talk more about icebreakers, but having a, a really cool icebreaker that takes people's attention works well in the, the unsheltered, the street count, and also in the sheltered count. And uh, uh, speaking of like, the role of peers and persons with lived experience, we made that honorariums available in the shelters, right? So if they had peer teams that they worked with, we would train them on how to do the count, provide honorariums from us so that it doesn't come out of the organization's honorarium budget to have peers come into that space, and then it felt more natural in the space as well. So that had a big impact. Uh, is not just saying, okay, it's the outreach worker, but how do we make sure there's reasonable honorariums or, or meaningful honorariums for you to bring in your peer teams and have them part of, of the counts and shelter spaces? So we saw a lot of harm reduction teams come into the counts on those days and help with the, uh, the surveys. I think you, you set that segue up better than I did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, we are hoping to, to hear from you in terms of some of the ways that you use volunteers. Uh, I'm sorry, peers, not volunteers. <laughs> uh, what are some areas where 
there are further opportunities for peer involvement. We talked about some of ours, but would love to hear about some of the ways that you're using peers in some of the work that you do or within the homeless counts, or if there's ways that maybe today you're thinking about because of our conversation. Anyone? Okay, yeah, great. It's for the translators. Oh, it's for the, okay, fine. Um, I, I don't do point in time counts. I'm one of the people that the data goes to sometimes to make recommendations for funding. So I am outing myself. Um, but, uh, and they're incredibly valuable. The, I did go out and volunteer about 10 years ago in the city of Edmonton to do a count because I felt that a first hand experience would be healthy. Uh, for me, turned out to be scary for me and not so healthy for the people that I tried to survey. So I totally applaud the fact that you've moved to people who are far more skilled than I at working with the populations directly, um, treating people uh, with respect. I had a lady throw herself back against a building screaming that I was from immigration. So that wasn't you know, it was traumatic for both parties. Um, it didn't matter what I said, she didn't believe me after that. And, um, you know, she kind of ran away. So not a good start, and I, and I didn't go back um, and do it again for that reason. So number one, that's fantastic. I know it's probably more expensive, and you save in some volunteer training, but you, you know, it's, it's gonna have a cost in a different way. Um, so what are other roles that maybe volunteers such as me you know, can play, I guess, is, you know, we heard earlier this morning um, from the gentleman from, what was it, Abacus uh, Data, talking about um, whether, um, you know, if you get 10 people to call and so on. I mean, it's, it's knowledge and understanding and sharing and um, appreciation for the information that's being shared is probably one of the biggest ones um, and trying to engage that. But maybe, you know, leaving the people with the, the experience and the skills and the relationships to actually, you know, develop that. I do have a related question, um, if I could, please. So what I understand in a very rudimentary way around social science uh, research is that, you know, consistency is critical. Um, to, to rolling up data and what I wonder about is you know this has been an evolving process in so many ways and those questions have changed probably every time every community has done it they've changed in some way so how do you remain consistent even when you talked about having you know residential and, and day and the references and them being different and having different um, impacts um, on the people engaged how do you then weed that out so that you're comparing apples to apples? Yeah, well, uh, thanks for your question. Uh, I'll start with your, your first part and, and first, you know, applaud you and, and thank you for, as the person using the data to go out and try to find an opportunity to understand how that sausage is made, so to speak. Uh, absolutely. So we still, you know, if there are folks that are involved in decision making, we did put a small call out uh, in communities that if they want to come out, we will find a role for them uh, if they're coming from that place. And usually like I would go out with them and we would do it in a way that uh, so they really understood the methodology, understood where it's coming from, understood the limitations as part of it. So we still have that opportunities uh, for like elected officials sometimes wanted to attend for that reason. So we did make exceptions and they were very facilitated experiences. Um, general community volunteers, uh, they had lots of opportunities to participate as part of magnet events, which we'll touch on in a, a couple slides. So the events on the day next of the count. Slide. What? Next slide. Ne oh, the, literally the next slide. Great. <laughs> <laughs> um, or uh, there was an example of a couple communities where they took donations to make door prizes to get things excited for youth events, things like that. Um, lots of other ways to, to get involved with a little bit of creativity. Um, yeah. Um, to the second question around consistency, um, the screening questions have remained the same uh, the entire time, so that, you know, filling, figuring out person doesn't have a place to pay rent. Uh, that part is always consistent and, and will always be. For the most part, I see Rebecca going, eh, we've, yeah, there's been a little back in, that's true. <laughs> um, and honestly, that, that's one of the questions that I kind of grapple with too, is we want to do right by the populations that we're doing these, these surveys in. Uh, we want to tell the stories through this, uh, but we also want to be good researchers. 
Um, so, you know, by keeping that screening relatively consistent, uh, by as much as possible adding new questions and not uh, getting rid of old ones, that's always a, a discussion to have because we want, in, in our context, we want to keep it to one page. Um, so there's always double-sided, yes, double-sided. Uh, they don't see the second side until they're halfway done. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that, that is one of the hardest parts, right? Because uh, every time we do this, we open up, we want to hear feedback on the survey, and we hear lots of people bring these stories around, you know, yeah, we know youth who do not identify as straight who are not doing this survey. How do we do better? And you hear that, you're like, we want to do better. Um, I think we, we just frame that when we do the reports around telling people what we've done differently, telling people what is new, um, and hopefully making, helping them make some decisions around that. I also encourage folks to never use point in time counts as the only decision making tool. Find something else, whether it's qualitative experiences from outreach workers, shelter turnaway data, something like that, um, that complements that uh, and tells a story alongside it. Is there anything you want to add on that piece? Yeah, I, just a, a tangent or a connected thought, I guess. Just as you we were speaking, I was thinking about one of the challenges in using outreach workers and peers is you, you're trying to leverage their relationships, but you have to make sure that the responses are who they're speaking with and not what you think about that person. So we're always telling them, like, suspend what you think you know about this person and make sure you're writing what they say. And that is a danger in using outreach workers because often it's like, no, no, that's not you. You're this. And you, you put what you think about the person as opposed to how they're presenting and what they're saying to you on that day. So we know it's all self-identified data. So even if that person, you know they have a mental health issue, but they say they don't have a mental health issue, you write no because it's all about that self-reporting data. And that is, has to be consistent over time. So whether using volunteers or anyone, it's always that self-reported data on that day. And that was just we, something we had to reinforce through the training. Just make sure you stay consistent uh, with what they say, because it's, it's their voice that needs to come through, not what you think you know. Good. Magnet events. Yeah, <laughs> my favorite. Um, so magnet events are another classic piece of the, the point in time count toolkit, uh, sort of with the idea that you bring folks to a place to do the survey. Um, and it made sense when we're doing that buckshot approach of get as many volunteers out as possible and just random chance try to find as many people as you can. Um, with the focus on, on peers and outreach workers, uh, and quite frankly, with the time that coordinators saved not coordinating volunteers, we were able to get folks to be a bit more creative with the kinds of events that they did. We noticed a lot of events that in theory should work and didn't. So one of the sort of older uh, sort of pieces of advice was to you know, go to places where people are already. Okay, great. We're gonna to go to the meal programs, maybe we'll give them uh, 500 bucks to order pizza and give the cook the day off and uh, make something special to make sure people go to that. But that program is already serving a population and we're not getting anybody new by having an event at that place. Yes, we still wanna do it. We wanna be able to do as much as we can to show gratitude to folks doing the survey. So any opportunity we have to do something special, absolutely, let's go for it. Um, but in order to get new people to do the survey as part of this, it took a little bit of creativity. Um, so here's a few examples of ones that, that I thought worked quite well. Um, anything that was indigenous led, uh, so we actually had a Friendship Center as our agency that we contracted to coordinate the entire count in, in Smithers. Uh, and that was a sort of a, one of the most important parts of their, their day of, uh, was this event, a uh, big feast uh, with uh, singing, dancing, uh, things that people were used to going to. So they had events in this place and it brought people in that would definitely not be in, the in like downtown Smithers with me walking around the clipboard, finding them any other way. Uh, and also it was with, for people that, you know, were comfortable in that space and uh, had relationships with people who were there to do the surveys with them. So it was quite comfortable. Is it, quite frankly, a, a fun event? Um, it was one of, I think, my highlights of, of that trip, or of, of this, this project. Um, anybody that is, anything that is organized by somebody in the community that you're trying to reach. Uh, so youth magnet events, for example. So I've been doing this since 2017. Every time we talk about youth magnet events, somebody says, great, let's do a pizza night at the youth center. 
I've never seen that work. What did work uh, in Port Alberni was there was a, a youth committee at the, the youth center. Uh, and they were basically given a small budget and the task of, you know, come up with something that your friends will, who don't come here will come to. They come in, they have the option of doing the survey, uh, but that dramatically changed a number of youth surveys that were, were done in, uh, in Port Alberni. Um, and those were the folks that were not accessing that space uh, in, on a normal day. So a little bit of a knock-on benefit there of new people being introduced to a, a service and then doing the survey uh, and having that story told. And I emphasize that piece as much as possible. It's you know data, surveys, that kind of stuff, but you know every piece of paper in front of somebody, we're trying to tell that story in, in this way. Uh, and then we had a pretty good experience with one that was just in a, sort of a, a high walking sort of throughput park uh, in, uh, in Seashelt on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, and it was a barbecue, so come by and get a free hamburger. People hanging out, music, that kind of stuff. Uh, and people would just talk, would come by and say, hey, we're talking about housing and homelessness, that little bit that I, I had before. Asking some questions for folks that don't have a place to pay rent. And what that did, that was pretty good. We got a few people that came in that we wouldn't have otherwise. But the people that came in said, a, lot, a, a pretty significant handful said, oh no, I've got a place, but I know my cousin, brother, friend is couch surfing right now, do they qualify? Absolutely, text them, let's get them a burger, bring them down, this is, this is important. Um, particularly in that community where, where overcrowding uh, was a part of the story that people were talking about already in, uh, in community and not excited to talk about, but passionate. Uh, that was also a community that had a lot of working poor. So we yeah. had to really focus on events kind of outside of the working hours, the regular hours and that um, our count went a little longer in Seashelt than it did in some of the other communities. And that was, uh, again, feedback from the community saying, look, I, I, I'm working two jobs. I can come and get a hot dog really quick, but can you walk with me while I walk to the my second job? And sure. Um, so we did have sort of extended hours on, at that magnet event to accommodate that community. Uh, it was a... Uh, do you ever give out gift cards, was the question. Um, so we're getting into to icebreakers. We do, um, we have used gift cards in some communities where like that was specifically what the, the peers said, oh, we all go to McDonald's and we sit there and have a coffee together. And so that would be meaningful if we had some gift cards because then it also encouraged like the social interaction of everyone who's, who gathers at the, the Tim Hortons. Uh, they weren't always the, the things that we gave because that's like a promise of something later. So if there were a reciprocity, we wanted to keep them there talking to us. A cookie with their eating while they're talking to us kept them there longer where it was like, oh, I'm going to go get my coffee now. <laughs> what? What do we do in Port Alberni? They had an after-school hangout and played some video game that I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the gift card question is one that I am always go back and forth on, too. Like, as I, I've been, I was always told that you don't want to, like, you know, if something that has a dollar value, people might, you know, tell us, they might feel, you know, coerced or something like that. Uh, which I think sometimes could be true in the communities that we've used them in. Oh, and th there's also the risk of, you know, somebody saying, oh, you were giving out $10 gift cards to Tim's. It's probably, you know, one person did 30 surveys or whatever kind of thing. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, I, haven't s I haven't seen any of the harms. Um, I've only seen the benefits of having peer teams um, or people that have told us what they want, us being able to, to do it. Um, yeah. Uh, speaking of icebreakers, do you want Oh yeah, we're going to slide on that. <laughs> um, the value of the icebreaker, so there's two contexts here. So there's the, the smaller, uh, small to medium sized communities where you've got sort of a really tight knit group of outreach workers, peers, things like that. Um, yeah, I think they do what they want and it worked pretty well, the icebreaker was a way to sort of show gratitude in that, in that moment, to show that that person's important, all that traditional kind of stuff. Uh, the way the, the toolkit, the traditional method talks about icebreakers is a way to, to start a conversation with somebody that you don't know. 
that wasn't really necessary when we were using folks who knew the people they were talking to. So it needed to be something that got people interested in doing the, the survey. Um, so that's why we got a little bit more creative. Um, you know, gift cards were good. There was also a community that uh, they had their mental health clubhouse bake muffins for everybody. So you got this really cool organic muffin. Uh, in Greater Vancouver, we used these chocolates. So these are from an Indigenous-owned business. If you're ever in uh, the Vancouver area, go to Hype Chocolate. These are tasty. They also make very good milkshakes. Um, and I think they were about six months old when we started this project, and we still have their, that was their biggest sale to date. Uh, it was icebreakers for the entire count for Greater Vancouver. Um, and that was really cool because we were able to show that... Um, it's more of a meaningful sort of piece of food than a granola bar. It's something that's different. Um, the other piece that I noticed is you also, I tell volunteers, in Greater Vancouver, we still use uh, quite a bit of volunteers in, in some of our areas. And I would always tell people, you know, talk to everybody about the count. Tell everybody what you're doing. You never know who's going to say, oh, that's me. I don't have a place to pay rent. So that was the other thing that I encouraged folks to consider when talking about Magnum events, is something that will stop people and be like, what are you doing? So granola bar, cigarette, most people are going to say no to a cigarette. Um, but if you go up and say, do you want no Henry or do you want a chocolate dipped Oreo? They're going to be like, what are you doing today? And at least that person has stopped and you can have that conversation. Uh, but it was really that, that personal relationship that went, I think, the extra little bit uh, in communities uh, outside of Greater Vancouver or the, the closer-knit like uh, communities within Vancouver itself. And then in Vancouver, we also had tobacco ties, so as a, as a sacred me uh, medicine. And so we worked with all of our, our trainings, and as we were giving them out to, to the uh, surveyors, like we really tried to clarify the importance of the tobacco tie and had Indigenous elders talking about the tobacco tie and what it means and to offer it to everyone because you don't know if someone's white presenting if they're they're indigenous and, and a lot of uh settlers or, or would ask well what what is that what is that can i smoke that and we're like it's actually uh not smoking grade tobacco it's it's meant for ceremony so if it's not something that is meaning to you please pass it on to someone who it has meaning to and gift it to them so it was really important to us to, to provide the, the cultural context of the tobacco tie and also just to reflect the reciprocity that we're we're trying to give a gift to you as thanks for you to engaging in this conversation that we recognize can be re-traumatizing and we recognize has can has a cost to you and we're just trying to say thank you for for taking this time with us Anything else from the speakers? Not from me. Okay. Any other questions around those pieces? Yeah. It, it's you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. um, I'm sorry if you, I just went to the bathroom, so I'm sorry if you said okay. this. But um, what is there any thoughts around giving, like monetary? Like we were giving like $40. Yeah. Yeah, so were you here for the gift card part? No. Okay. So we, uh, like when I started this, the people who were telling me how to do this said, you know, absolutely don't give anything that has a dollar value assigned to it because you're going to get people that are coerced and all this kind of stuff. We, um, in a couple, a hand, less than a handful of communities, um, through engaging with the, the peer groups that were planning the count with us, they said gift cards would be the most important thing to give. So we did that. Um, nominal value, like 10 to $15. Um, and what I was saying before is we didn't see any of the harms of that. Uh, we only saw the benefit of people being able to show that they were seen and valued and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, in terms of cash itself, um, yeah, I, I know that's the standard for surveys. I think that's one of the big ones that we're going to sort of have to do some engagement around the next time we do this. Um, sort of back to that piece around um, tradition, uh, quite frankly, being important in, in point and kind counts and the, the culture of them in many communities in BC. Uh, that would be a big shift. Uh, but I know uh, that there's been a lot of research, particularly during the pandemic, that, that pays cash and we want to make sure that we're, uh, we're valuing people as much as, as anything else is. I expect more engagement around that. I don't think I have an answer to what we would do yet. Um, yeah. That's, that, is, that is one of the tough ones, though, for sure. Yeah. Uh, so the question was around using cash. Anyone have any 
like we're not the experts here either, so looking for anyone who has any thoughts or reflections on providing cash honorariums for those completing surveys. I would say, though, you want to maintain some sort of value, some sort of ability to just ask anyone. So that piece around being, hey, would you like a chocolate bar? Would you like a chocolate covered Oreo? Like getting that like mass kind of thing. Um, if I was just walking down the street saying, would you like 40 bucks? You want to be able to give it to everybody regardless of whether or not they do the survey. You're going to run out of money if, unless you're working in, in, pop, in areas that you know folks don't have a place to pay rent. Um, but we did get a a lot of surveys on particularly that hidden homelessness component um, in areas that were just like the mall hanging out kind of thing. Um, in, in one of the communities we had uh, there was sort of a spot on the radio in the morning um, and then at the end the, the radio host called and said, hey, I, that actually is me, can I come by and, and do that? And I was like, oh yeah, abs absolutely. Um, so yeah, there, it's a tough one. Good question. Um, so there was a, Alex asked about youth strategy, so we have a bit of a presentation around youth strategy, if you wanna start on that one. Yeah, uh, the youth strategy very much is the, the same theme as we've, uh, we've been touching on. Uh, talk to the people who know the people that you're trying to get in touch with and don't try to come up with an idea your, yourself. Um, particularly when you're in different communities. So I said the idea of everybody wants to do a pizza party at the youth center to get the youth. Uh, there was one that went really well, uh, and that's because that youth center told me that it would. So that was good. Um, really about engaging with people who are, who are in touch and, uh, and know, and, and part of that is, is schools. Uh, and we've been trying in different ways to get uh, in touch with schools in point in time count since about 2018. Uh, they definitely vary in, in their engagement, uh, depending on the school board and, and who's in charge, and it's a, an extra layer of, of work that goes in to get approvals and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it can be really powerful. Uh, so in Prince Rupert, uh, there was one alternate school that had one staff member that said, I know everybody here, tell you what, I'm just gonna go and do these surveys on this day drop them off in the morning, which is what I did, went through the survey, came back with uh, a stack of surveys completed. Um, and that changed the result from, I think, around a dozen uh, or 12% in, uh, in 2021 uh, to 26% uh, youth under 25 uh, in the, this year's count. Um, yes, that piece around methodology change, but I think it is consistent enough that we're still just trying to get people who know people, and that is sort of the, the methodology that we're, we're going with. Um, so the encouragement there is to kind of leave no stone unturned, ask around, uh, find somebody, and it really was just that one person was, was able to make the difference. With the caveat, though, of if one person is there this year, you better make sure they're there three years from now. Uh, there was another community that the opposite happened. They had their one person in 2021 and they didn't have their one person this year. So we had kind of the caveat, the asterisk of youth homelessness didn't get solved. One person just took a new job. And that's really hard to explain. So really understanding when you're getting surveys back, who the outliers are and making sure that they figure out a way to do that again next time. And that can, there's outliers in terms of who does surveys in all sorts of areas, like outreach workers, there's always one that brings back more and it takes a little bit like, okay, what did you do? How do we figure out that we do that next time? With, uh, in Prince Rupert, uh, youth went up. We also saw a dramatic increase in folks who didn't identify as, as straight go up. And a, lot of, and a lot of those were in those, those youth surveys. Um, so this is something that I, I share because I'm, I'm proud of the, the work that that one person did. Uh, it shows that that engagement, that sort of leaving no stone unturned and him being empowered to, to do that, that's a dramatically different story that has not been told in, in Prince Rupert before. Uh, that is now a group of people, organizations that can access funding that have a story to tell and a rationale behind it. Um, and that is, I think, one of the reasons people keep or I think I like to keep doing point in time counts is you're able to tell those stories um, in a different way. 
and in a way that's you know, kind of accepted as a, a method. I think you went through most of this. Yeah, I think we talked a lot about youth. Um, so this is the slide that we had on it. Uh, definitely leg work, get outside of your comfort zone. Uh, if you haven't worked with youth in a while, like I had at the time, uh, forget everything you knew about working with youth before that. Uh, ask the questions. Uh, there's that, that second bullet there. All schools is probably ideal. Probably pretty much every school will have one student who is uh, you know, not staying with their parents full time. Um, Survey fatigue became a thing. Students are another population that people like to do surveys, particularly students in alternate programs. Um, and maybe I'll clarify too, we were super clear with staff that you know none of your students are paying rent, we know that. Uh, it's the follow-up piece around where do you stay last night if they're not staying with their parents on a regular basis and they're not safe there, that's what we, we screened in. And that sort of made staff feel a little bit more heard and like, oh yeah, that actually is the story of a lot of, or at least a couple of, of kids that I know. Um, just in thinking about youth as well, we did engage with a number of youth serving organizations that had the ability to engage with youth to, to hear the, their voice in some of the design and the questions we asked. But uh, in all of those engagements, we really tried to ensure that there was support for those youth as they were going through these conversations. Because I think that's true of all of our engagement with peers and persons with lived experience. Being part of the survey and conducting the survey could be re-triggering and re-traumatizing for them. So we partnered with uh, MRT, the Mobile Response Team, which is a, a BC-based program to provide support to support workers. People in the sector really started around the poison drug supply, but is available to uh, frontline workers across our province and so made sure those resources were available that there were counselors available that the Indian residential school was available not just for those who were taking the survey but also for the surveyors and that was probably the, the largest use were uh, use of uh, the hotline for the Indian residential school was the surveyors themselves who were being triggered by hearing those stories so trying to make sure that there's a lot of resources there to support those who are asking the questions as well as the peers who are involved in the process and that was really important when working with youth as well because sometimes it, it dug up a lot of their own traumas that they were dealing with and we wanted to make sure we didn't unpack something we couldn't help them repack again so it was really important that we had those supports in place throughout one of the other strategies around oh question no no ask I'm just wondering, in some communities, I've heard that they do extended counts where they um, work with outreach workers and other service providers after the day of the point in time count to um, see if they can find any other people that were missed during the count. And what I've heard is they tend to find um, demographic groups that tend to be missed by the typical point in time count. So I was wondering if that was done and if it's being considered. Sure. Do you want to start on that? No follow -up? Sure, yeah. Um, there's a few different ways to do extended counts, um, and that is one of the other critiques around point in time, is how can you find everybody in 24 hours? Um, the method that we use in this is just get people really excited about that 24 hours and really make sure they're empowered to you know, get, find people, phone them, figure it out like how to, to do it and tell them that it's important and, and you know, pay people for their time and expertise to, to do that. Um, but yeah, that's something that, that comes up and you kind of hear that around, uh, there's some similarities with some service use enumeration methodologies that go over say a month or things like that. Um, when we did the extended count in 2018 uh, in Cranbrook and Port Alberni, uh, really low uptake. Um, so simply extending the point in time wasn't the, the best way to, and the most effective way, the, the way we did it in, in my opinion. Um, because the service provider was already burnt out. Uh, the risk is that people you know, don't get excited about that point in time and for, for communities that need a point in time count for some reason, you don't want to water down the message of, oh, take it any time over the next week, but it's only that 24 hours that ends up in your point in time total. Uh, what I have seen work, yes, point in time, uh, and then combine that with uh, sort of a service delivery kind of thing. So use a, some unique identifier on your point in time count survey, uh, populate a survey or a, a spreadsheet with uh, that same unique identifier from different agencies. Uh, this was done on the North Shore in 2020. Um, in North Shore, so North Vancouver. Um, 
And that people ran, I think, for about two weeks. Kind of just like uploaded your caseload to this spreadsheet. Uh, and then went and looked at the, the unique identifiers in the point in time count and just removed the duplicates from, from there. That one did enumerate more people, uh, but it's a totally different methodology. And yes, a little bit of a, a different demographic, folks that access services less, uh, particularly in a place like North Vancouver where it's, uh, I think somebody talked about the difference between hot dog and Hamburg communities. It's a bit of a hot dog, you were in that one? Okay, <laughs> that was a bit of a hot dog. It's long and spread out with a lot of people that live outside the hot dog and aren't able to get services in this one sort of area. Yeah, and um, the reaching home for the subsequent counts, there you're able to do a, an enumeration in one day and a survey over, I think it's up to a month. So, I mean, we're interested to see how, how that rolls out. From our experience, that intensity of that day really does bring... Um, the, the the largest results and then coming up with different ways to engage with populations that don't you don't typically see on that day. So as James said, we'll talk a little bit about uh, marginalized genders next. Uh, telephoning was a big part of that. So having outreach workers and case workers and, and transition houses and uh, women serving organizations and, and community being able to call up people they knew who they didn't see that day just to say, hey, come on down. If you're not coming down, we can do the survey now with you over the phone, but we're having dinner tonight. Make sure you come down. So trying to find different approaches to try to engage with people you might not see that day to still bring that intensity in that 24 hours, we found probably more success in, in that approach as opposed to extending it. And as James said, it's just, it seems easier to tell an outreach worker you've one day put as much effort as you can in as opposed to like, doing this over a month, over everything else you're doing. So that's been a large part of our experience. Um, around the youth strategy, James had mentioned just a little bit uh, around bringing in other data sources this year, we, we uh, worked closely with the McCleary Foundation that was doing a qualitative research over the same period of time. We were able to amplify each other's work uh, in terms of when we were in communities, we're saying, well, make sure you're also doing this survey. Uh, worked with a lot of the same schools and the organizations. And so their, their research brought forward a lot more qualitative information. And so we're trying to, while we talk about youth, we're also trying to direct people to, the, to this research because it really shows a much larger story than we're able to get through the point in time. So I think it's really, really important that even through your point in time counts when we talk about this, this is only one methodology where you can try to leverage it to support other methodology that may be happening in your community that can tell a larger story. So don't just narrow yourself to that one piece of work. Try to create relationships and connections to the other work that's happening. Uh, so in speaking about marginalized communities, one of the big pieces that we, we conducted this year was engaging with a lot of uh, women's organizations like the Downtown Eastside Women's Center, WISH, uh, ATIRA, and just really went through the survey with them in a really constructive way, like what are the things that were missing from this, and that included adding a client's place as a, as a place they stayed the night before, because that wasn't on the list, adding sex work as a source of income uh, to try to really tell that story, and then it really, I, I think it's, it's still an undercount, and we're still working with our, our partners in, in the uh, women serving sector and gender diverse serving sector, but at least it began to tell a more robust story of what experience, what homelessness looks like for, for uh, underrepresented gender populations in counts. And we saw some of the results from Port Alberni. Um, did you want to talk about that? Uh, yeah, so this is, this is one um, with another sort of like dramatic change uh, since the, the count before. Um, what made the difference here was being able to, to reach folks uh, by phone. Um, so this one was a case where we got a huge outlier. We had two outreach workers that basically did all the surveys and they found all their people. Uh, and one of them was, fo was one that uh, specifically worked with, uh, with women uh, who are looking to change their, their housing situation. So don't have that stable place to, to stay for now. Um, and I think that, so this is the community that's, that stuck out the, the most. Uh, and that's one of the things that's always told about the point in time count, which is in, this is true, men tend to be counted more than, than women um, or folks with, with other genders. Um, and it's just another example of that person that knows the person is your ticket to being able to tell those stories. 
Um, so as part of that engagement strategy on the days of the count, uh, we typically had dropped off like surveys at transition houses, but we didn't really encourage them to, to do the demographics as much as we did this year. Like we really explained to them the importance of doing all the demographic data, because otherwise uh, if they just did the enumeration, then the, the, the gender question would get lost in, in the data and it would, women would look underrepresented. So put a lot of emphasis on working with transition houses to make sure they really understood the importance of not just telling us how many people were there, but completing the survey to help tell that larger story. Uh, and then working with, with women serving organizations and gender diverse ser serving organizations like community who don't typically have like a significant role in working in the homelessness sector, but are understanding that they may have people on their caseload or people that they're working with who could respond to that survey. So trying to reach out more deliberately to not necessarily just homeless serving organizations that work with women in gender diverse populations, but with those organizations that don't traditionally do that to understand, help them understand the importance of ensuring that that research is done or those surveys are done. Yeah, um, food banks was a, a common one uh, in a couple of communities that, uh, that brought uh, some folks in. Uh, and really being clear with the definition around them of saying we're doing a survey, with, again, and I'm, I'll, pro I'll stop saying this eventually, but we're looking for folks that don't have a place to pay rent. Starting even the conversation with the service provider around that, that is a totally different thing because there's a lot of organizations that don't think they are involved in homelessness. They're not in the homelessness serving space, but they provide... Uh, employment, food banks, uh, counseling, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so use that same pitch of, do you know folks that don't have a place to pay rent as you do uh, when you're engaging with uh, the person as you do with the agency? So we have these, these specific strategies looking at youth, looking at marginalized gender populations and the other piece of the strategy was really trying to look at vehicles and uh, encampments. Do we all know about the growth of encampments in our communities and we wanted to make sure we were entering into encampments in the right way. So for many encampments across BC, there's a, a, a protocol way to enter into an encampment. There's elders and uh, over-representation of indigenous people within those encampments in many cases. And so they've, they've set up approaches or ways that you, you should enter into that encampment in a good way. So we approached the leadership of those encampments to better understand how we should be coming into the community, how we should be engaging in some communities they, they brought their uh, residents together to help conduct the survey. So we would just come in with some Subway sandwiches, uh, set up a table. Some of the residents themselves, we trained them on how to do the surveys and they would go throughout the encampment and engage uh, as, well, as well as we did as well, making sure that everyone got connected in some communities in some encampments, it was okay to knock on the tent and say, are you there? In other places, it was, this is their space, do not walk into that space. So really try to understand the culture of each encampment because they were different in the places that we went and let our peers and those outreach workers who are in those spaces really lead that engagement. And that was really deliberate. Um, we didn't have you know, teams that weren't used to dealing with, if you worked in a shelter and you weren't used to working outside in, in the community with encampments and RVs, we didn't want you going out and doing that work. We were really deliberate around who we brought out to, to lead that work. Yeah, so I need some more. Yeah, I was just going to pass to you. <laughs> um, yeah, so every encampment was its own uh, culture, and we wanted to make sure to, to respect that. Um, we also saw that around uh, vehicles, uh, particularly some areas where folks, you know, gather and live in vehicles together. So, like, large parking lots, uh, streets, I think uh, people have sort of have an idea of, of what I'm talking about there. Uh, but that ends up being a community uh, in itself. Uh, so this little graph shows uh, folks in Squamish, 56% of people living uh, unsheltered on the day of the count uh, stayed in a vehicle the night before. Um, one of the big things around vehicles uh, is that's where we were told loud and clear, don't use the word homeless. Uh, and we learned that actually quite quickly. I think we would have figured that out on, on our own. Um, but that's where you want to be talking about rent, talking about housing, um, those kind of things. Uh, and then use an icebreaker that, that really makes sense. So in Squamish, uh, what we heard is there's a, that we were given Tim Hortons and McDonald's gift cards. So like, great, we'll just bring both and people can choose. But we ran out of Tim Hortons gift cards because that was closer and that's where they used the Wi-Fi uh, whenever they could. So really listening even on, on those pieces. Um, 
and just be friendly. Uh, walking around, hi there. Uh, you know, yes, you're going to be holding like a clipboard or something. You're going to look like a bit of an outsider to, to that community. You might look like an authority figure. Um, being really clear up front that, you know, we've got something for you. I've got this gift of a, a gift card. No strings attached. We're just looking to talk to folks about homelessness and housing. Really showing people, I'm not putting your name or anything on the, the survey. That's one of the, the classic pieces of advice from the, the toolkit. Uh, but that was really important here. Like, I'm not writing down your vehicle description or your license plate or anything. I don't work for the Walmart that we're parked in. Uh, this is just to, to help with housing uh, and homelessness and tell that story in your community. Um, was really important to, to emphasize. Uh, I'm going to put a question out to the group, and I'm hoping there's some insight and expertise here. One of the areas that we struggle with is is boats and maritime counts. Uh, in in the West Coast, we have a lot of people who are living in pretty rough boats that are unanchored into the water. We don't have rowboats and go out and conduct the counts. Uh, we were told in Gibson that there was a, a, a laundry mat that a lot of the, the boat dwellers came in and used, and so we kind of tried to work with a the laundromat. They weren't too interested, but we, we had, uh, I went by a couple of times and tried to do some surveys there. We're really looking to see if anyone's got some insight around how do you engage with those who are, who are uh, homeless living on boats. Anyone have any advice? Because I'd really appreciate it. Lots of cookies for The oh yeah yeah uh, so the comment would would going out to the boats make sense just for the I don't at all pertain to know a lot about boat culture um, but I would suspect that that's a very classic case of I don't consider myself homeless right yeah. I I own this boat I was gifted this boat I have this boat. Um, so I know in some communities like Salt Spring Island and others, a laundromat is difficult because public water is difficult. Um, Pender Island has, um, it, any, if you tap into people that are in the sailing community, they often know where those stops are that people go in for a shower. And a, but it would be really similar to say, veterans who are I work with that are so far on the outskirts that they just pop in once in a while. So a 24 hour count isn't going to necessarily catch them because they're self-sufficient for a very, very long time. And that comes with the mindset, right? If, if you grew up sailing, and I didn't, I just have friends that do, um, they realize very, very early that if something happens when they're out, they have to deal with it, right? There's, there's no... 911, there's no fire brigade, there's nobody coming for them. So if they have a medical emergency or something, um, they really have to deal with it on their own. So it, yeah, good luck, because that would be a really unique challenge to try and grab in 24 hours. Um, and very similar to, a, they're probably not going to be receptive to somebody coming up in a dinghy. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I got some cookies, <laughs> right? Yeah, it might not work. Thanks. Um, yeah, so the, did, did you hear that? The comment was, uh, I was speaking to the translators. Um, <laughs> the comment was, um, someone must know they're out there. Uh, so, so connecting with the marina master, connecting with the, the local police force, they'll know that they're out there, but will they identify as homeless? And I, I think particularly we're talking about uh, some of the, the watercraft that are no longer saleable, right? They're, they're clearly moored there, not moving anytime soon. They live on that boat because they can't afford to live anywhere else, and they may be coming in every once in a while. So is there a magnet event that might bring them or something? It, it's a question we're grappling with, so I appreciate all the advice. Thank you.
So the, uh, the comment was around census data. Is there a way to dig into some of the census data and are they counted in the census data? That's a good question. Yeah, census is conducted in, in shelters, um, but it's imperfect. Are you talking about the boat community or are you talking about in general? Okay. Yeah, there, there's some work that's been done around linking, uh, you know, the census data that are completed in shelters or indicate in other ways that the person doesn't have a place of their own, uh, linking that with CRA data to show the folks that are collecting certain benefits or things like that. There's, there is work being done around that. Um, the challenge is it's it, a little bit, it, it only, it really it does it well for folks that are in shelter. And well is uh, with a lowercase w. Um, yeah, do you have any more comment on that? No, I was wondering how much time we have, actually. 15 yeah. minutes or yeah, less. I mean, technically, the plenary starts in 15 minutes, so you can probably okay. start wrapping. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, we're at that point. Um, yeah, question back there. Um, thank you. It's not a question. I'm... My name is Tara. I'm from Canada Revenue Agency. Uh, we, <laughs> have, um, we have a program called Community Volunteer Income Tax Program. So we partner with organizations across mm -hmm. Canada to help low to modest income people get their taxes done free of charge. I can't share information um, about our organizations, but it's online on our website. Our, so you can do the research and see if there's any organizations around these marinas, around where they might be located, and maybe reach out to the organizations themselves to see if you can work with them because they will, because the taxes are done free of charge, mm -hmm. that's a way for them to get all the benefits that they're entitled to. Um, so that might be a, a way to do it. Okay? Yeah, okay. thanks for that comment. Uh, income tax clinics in a couple communities we use as magnet events. Uh, that was a really powerful tool to bring people out. So uh, that very important program, thanks for that. I ran a few for a couple of years. Uh, yeah, they're great oh, yeah. programs. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we're down to the last three slides. So why don't we just finish that and we'll give some more cookies and you can head to your next session. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think there's anything new on this uh, that we haven't talked about. Um, supervised construction sites, that was the only thing that was pretty universally useful. Uh, the peer witness person having them enabled and empowered to, to have some surveys and some, some suites uh, was pretty effective. Uh, but I think we've said points on meeting people where they're at, talk to people that know people already. And then just in terms of the things that are kind of, we've found to be extra important in, in rural and remote communities, uh, engaging with, with First Nations like themselves, the, the nation, really asking a lot of questions. The, the relationship between the municipality and the nation is gonna be different in all sorts of parts of, uh, of Canada, understanding where it's at, reaching out to them directly whenever possible. Uh, there were a couple communities that we did do surveys uh, in buildings that were operated by the, the nation, uh, separate data sharing agreements, making sure they get all that, that data back. Um, really focus on the peers, folks with lived experience, particularly those folks with lived experience, you know, not of necessarily street or sheltered homelessness, um, but people who have lived experience of couch surfing, living with others, things like that. Um, that's a, a group that you're uh, gonna need a bit more help finding people. Uh, keep events local, um, engage with, we had uh, in Smithers, the, they did a business community drive to get donations for door prizes, things like that. That was a really cool way to engage and still get some of those knock-on effects of the community being more aware and empowered to do something about homelessness, even though they aren't being asked to volunteer on the day of the count. We also found them in, uh, like really interested in the results in a way they hadn't been before. Because they, they donated to the gift basket, so then they want to see the fruits of their labor, right? So it was an interesting way to engage the, the business community because now they were, like, bought in to seeing when the report came out. They were, like, asking, is the report out yet? Is the report out yet? Kind of neat. Yeah, and then, and then use that, like, dramatic amount of time you will save coordinating volunteers and spend it on uh, reaching out to those that... Uh, are traditionally, the, we all know, undercounted in the, the traditional point in time methodology, the ones that we talked about, and then any others that uh, will be relevant in the communities that you're from. 
the approach for encampments and, and vehicles changed a bit as well. Like encampments within rural and remote communities can sometimes be quite far afield. So really working with uh, people who you know at Madeira Park, or you know the people that are have connections further out from the community is really important because you want to make sure that they're counted as well because they can be quite deep in the bush sometimes. So you want to try to come up with specific strategies or have someone who knows them and knows what time they're there, train them. So you, you may be training someone who's only going to go and do two, two, three, two or three surveys that day, but it's worth it because those two to three people wouldn't have been counted otherwise because they were far out to reach and you really needed a specific strategy in order to engage with them. Um, so using some of that local expertise to, to try to really reach out to encampments and to vehicles. And then just sort of a quick comment that I generally share on point in time counts. Um, they are not the coolest tool, the newest, shiniest thing out there in terms of how to enumerate or get demographic information about folks experiencing homelessness. Um, I think they remain relevant, uh, like I said, in BC, our sort of culture and the way the reaching home communities are spread out. Everybody wants to compare themselves to others with this methodology, the trend over time being valuable. Um, I think it's unique in that it doesn't require participation in any services. So the folks who are hidden and not identifying as experiencing homelessness and reaching out uh, can do a survey and, and be included with a little bit of uh, strategy on, on how to find them. Uh, the community engagement, the buzz that comes around, putting all that energy that into that 24 hours that can introduce folks into to new services. Uh, they're also the thing that most communities have been doing for so long. Uh, so using a benchmark to compare to uh, as new enumeration methods, uh, by names lists, things like that get uh, implemented or is useful. Uh, comparing potentially the, the population uh, in each, yeah. Traditionally in, in BC, it's always been uh, between like March and April uh, of a year. Um, reaching home communities, it's the, the every three. Um, BC count, the, the one in those 20 communities we've done in 2018, 2020, 21, and now this year. So a weird interval for that one, but usually the spring. Yeah. And then the reaching home counts fall 2024 is the next. Uh, federally funded counts are fall of 2024. So we'll see what seasonality, how it impacts. And recognizing that BC seasons are a bit different than seasons across the country. So seasonality may play a bigger role. Yeah, but I mean, we do have an entire north that has as much snow. <laughs> um, so we did have another discussion. I think we're just going to leave that, recognizing that you need to get to your next session. But if you if you do have a chance to come up, grab another cookie, and if you want to tell us about something that you're still challenged with, we'd love to have more conversations with you. And then this is our contact information. Please encourage you to reach out with any follow-up questions or any learnings that come up. And that QR code is to our reports if you want to see those. Thanks so much, everyone. Really appreciate the conversations today.